How many great human figures have there been in history? They've started some significant project, possibly what we might call their life's work, and they were never able to finish it. It said that Michelangelo died several sculptures still in his workshop. Certainly his painting, The Entombment, it's called. It's, a, it's the scene of the burial of Jesus. That was a painting that Michelangelo never finished. Mozart, he died before completing his... The, the, the missing movements are said to be finished by his students. Leonardo da Vinci, another painter, perhaps one of his most famous paintings, at least as Christians would look at it, would be the upper room, the Lord's Supper. You know that scene of the table and the so-called disciples and Jesus. That was not fully, at least in its original. It said that that original had part of the ceiling of the upper room not actually finished in terms of its painting. Matthew Henry, our Matthew Henry, he wrote, he wrote a great commentary of the Bible. Well, not exactly. He wrote the Old Testament commentary. He wrote that the commentaries are in the Gospels, but he died before finishing his famous whole commentary of the Bible. The rest of the work was done by other men. You see, many have never been able to finish some important that they began. But that's not our Nehemiah. Think of the joy that Nehemiah must have experienced on the day that we read about in Nehemiah chapter 12. Nehemiah has seen his major life work as now history would record it, completed. Not just the walls rebuilt, but under God's blessing, the people rebuilt. Yes, they had gone through difficult days as a people, but it gave rise to to this day of jubilation and rejoicing that we read it, we'll see in chapter 12 this morning. And so as the scriptures declare, those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. When we as God's people pass through times of tears, and we do, there was always the hope of a new day dawning. There is always the hope that though we sow in tears, we shall reap in joy. And here in Nehemiah chapter 12, we see an abundance of joy. It's like a new day has dawned in nation. Joy is written all over this chapter. Well, may God grant us that very thing this morning through his word. As we, as we come to this chapter, I want us to see three things, friends. We we'll look at the dedication... We'll look at the participation and thirdly, we'll look at the jubilation. The dedication. Remember where we are in this story. About a month before this, the walls were actually completed. That was recorded back when we were looking at chapter 6. But since then, remember, the the people had gathered to hear God and they came under conviction of sin and we saw that in chapter chapter 8. In chapter 9, they confessed their sins to the Lord. And as we moved into chapter 10, we saw them recommitting themselves to God, formally covenanting together to walk in God's way. Some of the people, as we touched on last time in the chapter 11, actually volunteered, put their hands up, to live in the city itself. And in chapter 11, though we haven't studied it closely, you see a list of names of where people lived those that lived in the city and those that lived in various villages and towns around the city. And then as we out into chapter 12, as I mentioned before, it commences with this long list of names. It's a list of the names of leaders of God's people actually from the previous hundred years. To be more precise, from the last 96 years. Looking back from Nehemiah's day, back in time, 96, all the leaders listed in this part of the chapter. Those initially, firstly it's mentioned, who who came back with Zerubbabel, the priests and the Levites, the the faithful servants of Jehovah, who were like the first generation of those that returned from the exile back to Jerusalem. And they're listed in verses 9. 
And then if you look down in your Bible, you'll see that's not the end of the list because verse 10 and following right down to verse 26 gives a further list of what are priests and Levites and that's all the people from that first generation right up until the time and including the time of Nehemiah. As I brought up to date with where we are. All of them, as far as we would understand, they were faithful servants who laboured on in what were, in that last 100 year period, difficult days. And you could imagine those people, they're just a list of names to us, but these are real people who, who laboured and who prayed. And it must have seemed to them that their prayers were not being answered. Nothing was changing. Nothing was happening. And yet these people persevered in a difficult time, in a barren time, in an otherwise discouraged period. Why do you think they're listed here? These people did not labour in vain. And, And so we can see just this list of names, it's here to encourage God's people who may be living in a similar difficult, similar day. But the point is, they had been faithful and that's what God calls us to be, regardless of the season we live in. Whether it seems like our prayers are being answered or whether it seems like they are not being answered, we are to be faithful. And so what does that mean for us? Well, when our witnessing seems to bear little fruit, when things are difficult in your family, or times are disheartening amongst God's people, What are we to do? Give up? No, we must persevere. We must be faithful like these ones, like these real people. We keep our eyes on our Lord and we seek his grace to be faithful regardless. And who knows what God might do into the future even after we are dead and buried and all that's left is our names in a family tree. Who knows what God might do. Paul could say to the church, to the Christians in Thessalonica, faithful is he who called you, who also will do it. The people in the generation of Nehemiah's day were actually standing on the shoulders of all these people listed in the first 26 verses. They're standing on the shoulders of the faithful ones who had gone before them, if you like, who had laid the foundation of what God did in their generation. And I would suggest to you that's why this chapter about the dedication of the walls commences with this seemingly strange and irrelevant list of names. It's because these people are part, if you like, of this work and their parts coming to fruition and the rejoicing that's happening on this particular day. They played their part in this great work. And what is actually shown here is that their prayers were answered. They did not labour in vain. Paul says some plant, others water, but God gives the increase. And here we're at a time in the life of this nation of joyful increase. In fact, this is, if you look at the whole Old Testament history, this is one of the high points of Old Testament history. Look at verse 27. At the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, they sought out the Levites in all their places to bring them to Jerusalem to celebrate dedication with gladness, both with thanksgiving and singing, with cymbals and string instruments and harps. Verse 30, it goes on to say, Then the priests and Levites purified themselves and purified the people, the gates and the walls, This is a day of dedication and obviously from verse 30, a day of purification. Everything in the city, the very thing that they've been engaged in, especially of building the walls, the gates, 
But everything, the, the priests, the, the people, the city itself is given over to the Lord. Now, we're not actually told what's involved in the dedication by this purification. We're not specifically told that in this passage. But if we have an understanding of other Old Testament scriptures and bring them to light on this, uh, what, what would be involved? Well, possibly there's the sprinkling of the, of the water of purifying or of separation it's, it's referred to in the Old Testament. The point is, purity is required. You can't worship, you can't serve God acceptably without purity. 24, remember? Verse 3, who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who may stand at his, in his holy place? He who has clean hands. He who has a, a pure heart, he says. Now, obviously, in the Old Covenant, it involved external ceremonies like the sprinkling of water. And, of course, such Old Testament practices were a shadow of something far more brighter. That they pointed, the sprinkling of water pointed to the, to the blood of Christ with which our cleansers are cleansed from dead works so that we might be able to be those fit and then ready for service of the living God. That's the, that's the teaching of Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews 9 says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, is your conscience? What from? Well, maybe it's not what we expect to hear. Cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And so without, the, without Christ's blood applied to your life, the best of your works are dead works. And none of it is counted as true service unto the living God. And so even as we just touch on this purification and see it's pointing us to Christ, we see we need to be washed in the blood of Christ. And yet here, just in this first section, we see this is a day of dedication and it came via purification. Okay, so we acknowledge what this day is, the dedication. Let's move secondly and come to more of the heart of the subject I'd like to up and that's the participation. And so as we read before from verse 27, we know that the Levites are there, right? The Levites are involved, they're, they're present with their instruments, did you pick up what instruments they got? They got cymbals. They've got stringed instruments. Now, by the way, that wasn't their idea. It wasn't, hey, I like the harp. I mean, I really do like the harp. Oh, but, but, but I like the double bass. No, 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 no. I, I actually prefer wind instruments. No, God prescribed in the Old Testament what instruments he wanted to be used in his worship. In verse 28, beyond just instruments, it specifically says, and the sons of the singers gathered together. The singers. Singers? Who were the singers? Well, they were the God-ordained, if you like, what we might commonly call choirs that were used in worship under the Old Covenant, especially from the time of David. It's mentioned, if you just drop down to the end of the chapter, to verse 46, it says, In the days of David and Asaph of old, there were chiefs of the singers and songs of praise and thanksgiving to God. And again, can I just quickly say that this wasn't their idea of what they like. Oh, we love a choir. I mean, a, I mean, we love a male choir. I mean, it is. It sounds nice. But it wasn't their idea. God prescribed under the old covenant that as part of his worship. And so we see it's connected to what they're doing on this day. Verse 31 then begins to tell us what was done in this participation in full dedication. What does verse 31 say? So, remember where we are here. This is Nehemiah's journal. So Nehemiah's writing. So I brought the leaders of Judah up on the wall and appointed two large thanksgiving choirs. 
One went to the right hand on the wall or the, the refuse gate. There are two groups, if you like, who, who marched around the top of the wall. That's what unfolds on this day. One of those groups goes to the right with various names of leaders mentioned then in these verses. That first group, uh, that first choir, if you like, that first group with a choir is under the leadership of who? Well, it, we're told that at the end of verse 36, that last little sentence. Ezra the scribe went before them. And that, we read it before as we read the passage, they climb up the stairs of David. So there were a set of stairs in this wall so that you can actually walk up to get up on the top of the wall. Don't think little brick wall. Some of these walls, remember, were big enough for houses to be in. Remember Rahab? Some of these houses were big enough for you to drive your chariot around on. And so they're walking up these steps to get up the stairs of David up onto the top of the wall. And this first group go in an anti-clockwise direction and they're singing as they go. And then we come to verse 38. It says, the, the other Thanksgiving choir went the opposite way. And I was behind them with half of the people on the wall going past the tower of the ovens as far as the broad wall. So here is now Nehemiah, he's the leader of the second group and they're going clockwise. And though we're not going to necessarily now, I have supplied for you in, in the notices so that you can look at this later and you can actually trace as a sketch there is there of a map of what some suggest is the, the, the wall of Nehemiah with all the various gates and where they were and you can trace it through later on if you like in the passage with the verses and you can see the direction that they went and where they were headed. Now, the wall wasn't a circle. Okay? The, the, the shape of the city wasn't a neat circle. So this illustration's going to fall down right at that point. But I'll tell you that up front. But just imagine that the wall is a circle. And imagine that circle is like a clock. Okay? So we've got a big clock and it's, the, it's the, the wall of Jerusalem. Where they start their journey, where the, where the two groups are, is like about 7 o'clock. Okay? Ezra's group goes anti-clockwise, Nehemiah's group goes clockwise, and where do they meet? They meet up about one o'clock. And why do they meet up at about one o'clock? Because that's where the temple is. And, and there they, they gather in the temple for what we would commonly call a service of worship. And you see that in verse 40. So the two thanksgiving choirs stood in the house of God. Picture the scene. As they're walking along the top of the wall, not just picture it, but listen to it. You, 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 could, you could hear their voices of one and the other uh, swirling around and echoing across the city. Don't think this is some massive city like Ipswich or Brisbane or something. This is what we would more commonly say like a town. And so it could be heard. They're up elevated. They're up on top of the wall. And you could hear that they're singing, echoing back and forth. It's a triumphant march around the walls. The crowds of the people are likely walking on the ground below them at the foot of the wall. And everybody's participating together in this great occasion of celebration around the walls. As you think about that, they're going, they're circling around the city. They're circling around. Doesn't that remind you of some other story in the Old Testament? Doesn't that remind you of, of Joshua and Jericho and them walking around the city walls? You know, to walk around something in the Old Testament times had the idea to, to dedicate something or to cut for God. Genesis 13 records Abraham being told by the Lord to walk around the land that God had promised to give him. It was God's land. Jericho is claimed for the Lord and in a few hours it's going to be God's Jericho. And here in this participation together around the walls, whose city is this? This is God's city in a special way, Jerusalem.
Of course, amongst those people, there are those two leaders. Ezra's got one you know, going the anti-clockwise. Nehemiah's got the other going the clockwise, coming up seven, eight, nine, ten, coming up to one. But think about Nehemiah. Just try and imagine him. Stop and look at Nehemiah. On this day, as he's walking around that wall, try and think about that man on that wall. What do you think he's thinking? Can you not imagine Nehemiah thinking about the last time he was up on the wall, walking around the wall that was recorded back in Nehemiah chapter 2? Back then, up on the wall, when it was, he was at night time, he was trying to do it on his donkey and had trouble because of the state of the wall. What a depressing sight that was that night. All those ruins. Imagine the discouragement that could fill his heart. The whole place is in a rubble, broken down, and of course it didn't take him very long to find out that that actually was almost like a picture of what the people were like. That the people were broken hearted. That the people were disheartened. There was a sense of being dispirited. And they had lived through a century of defeat. And he's come to And the people, it's like they've settled down and they've accepted things. Oh, well, this is just how it is and this is how it's always going to have to be. Fast track where Nehemiah is on this day. Now, as he participates with the people, what a difference God accomplished. And think how quickly God turned the whole thing around. It's only a few months. It's about a month since the wall was completed. How long did it take them to complete the wall? Only 52 days. So it's only been months to accomplish a massive task. Now, of course, reality check. Remember where we've been in our studies. This has been a very difficult task. Nehemiah had to deal with much opposition. You remember chapter 4. He had the ridicule of Samballat and Tobiah. He had their intimidation tactics, their threats against him. He had the enemy plotting against him. Rumours that were spreading and that was swirling. There were attempts to distract him and they wanted to halt the work. But then what about the people? You remember them in the midst of the work. When they're in the middle of the task. You remember how they were? Just go back to chapter 4 just, just to remind ourselves of what it was like. So soon before this. Chapter 4 and verse 10. Then Judah said, this is the people saying, the strength of the labourers is failing. There is so much rubbish that we are not to build the wall. We're running out of energy. There's no point. We might as well quit. Chapter 12. Where are we? Who's made the difference? God has. God has accomplished this. God turned the whole thing around and now on this day they're rejoicing. On this day of the joy of their dedication, there is a united participation of human leaders. We've acknowledged that. Yes, they had Ezra. Yes, they had Nehemiah. But all of them together, what were they doing? They were praising God. Because it was what God had done. They were not singing Nehemiah's praise. This is the Lord's doing. And it's marvellous in our eyes, they could say from Psalm 118. Friends, as we see this, we need to recognise that as humans, as believers, we are only ever mere instruments in God's hands. We're we're like conduit pipe. (laughs) That's all we are. And we're glad to be that. 
Because God is pleased to work through us and to do his work in us and through us to accomplish his own thing. And therefore it's him who must be praised. There's no plaque put up on the wall to the glory of Nehemiah. Or Nehemiah's wall. We, we sometimes may call that just in terms of which wall in history and which Jerusalem being rebuilt, but that's not what this is. He didn't have a plaque up for his name. Wh- whose wall is this? This is God's wall. <laughs> whose city is this? This is God's city. And so if there's a plaque anywhere, it's got three English letters that stand for something. It's got S, it's got D, and it's got a G. Soli Deo Gloria. To God be glory alone. You know, after roughly 30 years of ministry in the city of Geneva, where he preached for four to five times every week, that was transformed by the faithful ministry of a man whose name was John Calvin. The word of God had even had a reforming impact on the civil government in that place. When John Knox went to Europe and visited Geneva, he described the church that he found in Geneva as the most perfect school of Christ on earth. You know, John Calvin was a great leader but it wasn't easy for him. He was opposed big time, if you know the story. And yet he saw much good done over those years. When John Calvin died, he gave strict instruction that I must be buried in a plain coffin and in an unmarked grave. Lest anyone try and make a shrine out of my grave. He understood it right. Whatever had happened in Geneva, it was God's work. And God alone be praised. Now isn't that the same for us? The work of salvation. That's not due to our cleverness. That's not due to our great insight into truth. That's not due to our good. Jesus said, John 15, You did not choose me, but I chose you. The work of salvation, the work of regeneration, it's all of God from beginning to end. And therefore it is to his glory alone. Psalm 115 says, Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but to your name give glory. And that's what these people did on this day here that we read about in Nehemiah chapter 12. Now, what what were the two large Thanksgiving choirs doing up on the wall as they walk around the wall? Would you have any idea of what two large Thanksgiving choirs would be doing? Well, surely they would be doing what choirs do. (laughs) They would be doing what they have been equipped to do. They will what they have been practising to do. They will be singing. But what did they sing? Did they sing some, you know, local ballad that they got off the radio? Of course, they never radioed then. What was it that they were singing? Well, what does the text say? Well, the text doesn't tell us. The text doesn't give us the specifics, but it's normally understood and all commentators like together will say they're most likely singing the Psalms. And there are certainly some Psalms that you can read and say, wow, those words just seem to perfectly fit this situation. You know, one of those Psalms is Psalm 48. And toward, there's a couple of sections in Psalm 48, the first couple of verses, and then the last little section of Psalm 48 says from verse 12, walk around Zion, walk about Zion, go all around her, count her towers, mark well her bulwarks, her defences, consider her palaces, that you may tell it to the generation following, for this is God. 
our God forever and ever. That's what this does. It's not about Nehemiah, it's not about plaques, it's about God. That's what the wall was about. It's about God. That's what the city is about. That's what this whole work was about. This is our God. Our God forever and ever. That's that's what faith is about, isn't it? That's what our families are to be about. That's what our church is about. That's what the work of the gospel is about. That's what worship and service is about. This is our God. That's what we want to say. Not look at my nice construction of this part of the wall that my family did outside our house and draw attention to me. No, this is about God. And we want people to look at God, not us. This is our God and our God forever and ever. And so together there is this participation in that same direction. Which thirdly and finally to the jubilation the jubilation. And here, if you like, is the great flavour of this day. It's the atmosphere in the air. It's the climate of the occasion. Jubilation. And see how it clearly is stated in the passage. 7 says, Now at the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, they sought out the Levites in all their places to bring them to Jerusalem to celebrate. The dedication with mediocrity with no what's it say with gladness with thanksgivings and singing with cymbals and instruments stringed instruments and the heart if you go to verse 43 we, we again see the emphasis the jubilation coming out there and also that day they offered great sacrifices and rejoiced for God had made rejoice with great joy The women and the children also rejoiced so that the joy of Jerusalem was heard afar off. In the scope of that one verse there in verse 43, I don't know where you picked it up, but five references to joy in its various forms. See it again. They offer great sacrifices and rejoice. For God had made them rejoice with great joy. The women and the children also rejoiced so that the joy of Jerusalem was heard afar off. Oh. You see, it's not just the choirs singing. It's not just the fights, the men in leadership involved. What's the verse 43 tell us? The children, the women are rejoicing. They're involved. It wasn't left to the, dare we call it the music team. It wasn't left to the worship band up there on the wall. Else watched. And everyone else listened. That the day of dedication involved the participation of the entire congregation in this jubilation. Now at this point I just want us to stop and I want to encourage you brethren. I want to encourage congregational singing. We're told that that's a fairly rare thing today. Now for us, you say what? For us it's normal, right? But, you know, for many, if not most churches, it's actually not normal anymore. We've had visitors here very recently who actually were so thrilled and encouraged by our singing together. I surprise you. Some of those same people have gone to many other churches in their travels and almost All of those other churches they have found, they don't sing congregationally anymore. Everyone's watching what's happening up front. Everyone's listening to the music team up on the wall. Now though, you know, you may not have set out to do that. Reality is our congregational singing has ministered deeply to visiting brothers and sisters in the Lord who have come in amongst us and moved on as they've gone on on their travels. It has truly been a means of grace for them as they have joined in with us as we have sung (coughs) congregationally together to the Lord. So I want to encourage you. But before you get a big head about it, remember it's not about us, but this is our God. 
It's about our God forever and forever. Why this jubilation by the people though? Where did this climate of joy come from? Was it whipped up by the music team? Was it, was it stirred up because, oh, the sound of those instruments, I really like that. Is that what the passage says? No. The passage itself tells us that their joy was spiritual. Not mere emotion in the raw human sense. Now, joy is an emotion. But there are different ways to stir emotion. There are spiritual ways and there are carnal ways. And this passage is very helpful in terms of, of this issue. That, that You see, their joy was rooted in God. Who he was. What he had done for them and in them. Now let me show you it in the text. Verse 43 says, That day they offered great sacrifices. Here's the reason for... God had made them rejoice with great joy. And so this joy was God given. It's not humanly generated or emotionally manipulated. It's true emotion. It sure is. I remind you. Think what God had done for these people just over the last couple of months. God, remember, there was there, Nehemiah's back in Shushan. He's a cupbearer. He's in a high position. And God opened the way for Nehemiah to go from headquarters to Jerusalem. And remember, friends, God even stirred a pagan government to finance the construction of the task. God did that. And then when the task begins, God baffled the enemy who was trying to stop them. All the plots, all the schemes of men, God brought to nothing. They were real, but they came to nothing. God preserved the people. They felt that they were fearful. They got up, remember? Sword in one hand, trowel in the other. That that. God protected the people. God preserved the people. And then God energised the people. God gave them a mind and a heart to work, as the passage has told us. God revived their hearts through the preaching of the word. God convicted them of sin through that word. And then God gave them forgiveness. The people were before. They were weighed down under a spirit of heaviness. And God lifted their burden. In particular, God forgave their sin. That's where the liberty came. God renewed their hearts and and they had a fresh dedication to the work. So what's it all about? I hope you get the point. It was God. It was God. It was God. It was God. And so therefore, verse 43 says, For God had made them rejoice with great joy. When our eyes just mirror. When our eyes are on ourselves, when our eyes are on other people, when our eyes are on each other, we have we put ourselves on a track of depression. We need eyes for Christ. It is the Lord Jesus Christ is the one and the one alone who replaces ashes with beauty. He replaces a spirit of heaviness with joy. Not just for these people, but it's what he does for us today. Turn with me now in your Bibles to Isaiah 6. Some of you may have picked up. I was actually using scripture terms. Isaiah 61. And of course we come here and this is a wonderful messianic passage. This is a a passage that has reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah 61 says, verse 1, The Spirit of God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. We know Jesus quotes this in the New Testament about himself. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty... For ashes, 
the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. They may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. Why? That he may be glorified. Friends, here's the key. The ministry of Christ, not just in history 2,000 years ago, but the ministry of Christ in our own hearts and in our own lives, he's a healer of the brokenhearted. It's he alone who releases those who are in, in bondage. He sets prisoners free. Actually, if you still stay in Isaiah 61, look down to verse 40, uh, sorry, verse 10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. I shall be joyful in my God. Why? For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. So you see, the, the, the source of our joy is our Lord Jesus. It is God who makes us rejoice. That's the point. It is he alone who can replace that sense of I'm covered in ashes because I'm feeling depressed. He can replace the ashes and in its place he can give beauty. What a contrast. Throw ashes over yourself, you're probably not going to look too so that the contrast is clear. It's the Lord Jesus alone who can, who can give us a garment of praise and put that on us and that's a replacement for when we're feeling weighed down with the spirit of heaviness. Not just these people in Nehemiah's day. It's the source of true Christian joy and that's why Paul could say in 4 verse 4, Rejoice in who? In the Lord. And again I say, Rejoice. Actually, there in Isaiah 61, verse 3, he describes joy as the oil of joy. That's an interesting description. It's just like oil. He said, God given oil. And what is oil? Is, what's, what's oil used for in these days? It's used for igniting. It inflames. It brings heat. It inflames your love for God. And, and maybe we could also add it. it joys like oil. What, what does oil do to cogs? Lubricate. It helps lubricate things spiritually. It gets us moving for him. And we all know that. When you're feeling down, you don't feel excited to go and do anything. You want to stay at home and stay in bed. But joy is that which lubricates. It, it moves us to, to action. Remember Jesus in John, he actually makes this connection between love, obedience and joy. A love for the Father. He abide in His love. And then He says it shows itself in obedience to Christ. And that's when Jesus says that my joy may be full. My joy may remain in you. Sorry. And your joy may be full. And that fits Nehemiah 12 because they just come into a new level of joy and it's on the back of a fresh commitment to be obedient to our Lord. They're looking to the Lord. And they're, they're following and obeying the Lord. And what experience? They experience true joy. Trust and obey. There is no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Well, we've identified the source of their joy and as we close, the sound of their joy no, I think we get a hint of it from this very unusual expression in verse 43 there when it says that God gave them a joy, but it says they rejoiced. How? <laughs> Strange. They rejoiced with great joy. How do you rejoice with great joy? Well, it's like saying they sang with singing. That They ate with eating. It seems like, well, what's all these extra words for? Well, it's showing that their joy is full. It's wholehearted. They held nothing back in their earnestness. And I would suggest you in volume. They rejoice with great joy. And anyway, what do you think two large Thanksgiving choirs sounds like? Like people who really know how to sing. It sounds loud. Plus you add to that all the people that are walking around in the foot of the wall, the men, the women, the children. And we don't just need to surmise because the passage itself tells us, look at verse 42 at the end, the singers sang loudly 
They've got a director, yeah, they've got a choir director, but the singers themselves sang loudly. And then it says in verse 43, right at the wonderful way this passage finishes, so that the, the joy of Jerusalem was heard afar off. No PA system. No, no internet help, no Wi-Fi, but they can hear it somewhere else when they're nowhere near it. It's not of the choir. It's not just the joy of the leaders. What's the passage say at the end of verse 43? It's called the joy of Jerusalem. The whole people were engaged in this. The, the, the truth of what God had done for them made them... And it was evident by the way that they worshipped God. And even, I would suggest you, how loud they sang. The sound of it. They didn't all have trained voices. And with such a large number of people, they didn't all have perfect pitch. They didn't all necessarily stay in tune. And you may not have perfect pitch and you may not always be able to stay in tune, but we can all sing loudly. That's what they did. They all had voices. may not all have lovely choir voices, but they all had voices. And they used them for the Lord. It's a wonderful, wonderful description here. There was an excitement, there was a, a glow in their hearts. It wasn't something put on externally. They're, they're, they're giving their all as they glorify together in worship through song. No, no one's there showing off. They're lost in their delight of their God. And so that it tells us the neighbours could hear. Well, there's some day, mate. For us to sing so that the neighbours can hear. You know, I remember years ago doing some door-to-door visitation in the streets near the church at Rosalie in Brisbane, being surprised at what one of the local residents said who we didn't know, just met that afternoon when we went to knock on the door and that that particular house was just a, a couple of streets away from the church building, but it was still wasn't well, next door. Oh, oh you're from that, that church that has that that we hear every Sunday. And we said, no, we don't have a choir. That's just a congregation of ordinary people singing. And we weren't a big church. We were a small church. Brethren, if these people who lived in the days of types and shadows, if they should God with such jubilation and they could sing with such volume that they were heard afar off, then how much more should we? We have something or some things far more thrilling in terms of a fuller revelation than they did. We've got our king. He has come. Where did he come to? He actually came to that city. And he died outside these city walls to secure our salvation so that every one of our sins are washed away in his blood. And we can stand secure and firm just like those walls secure to know that we are covered by Christ's righteousness. Does that not make you glad? Some Christians need to tell their faces. Oh, you're glad. Christ has put a new song in our heart. It's a song about our Redeemer who lives forever. He's a risen Saviour. He's the reigning Lamb of God. May God help us to think yeah. rightly, yeah. clearly. Yeah. And may God help us to feel deeply what God has done for us in Christ. Let me close by asking you this personal question. Do you have a song to sing? You personally. Can you about your own Redeemer? Or is the reason why you lack joy in your heart and your life, is, is the reason why you have no real joy when you come to worship, is that because Christ is not actually your joy? Are you still in the prison of your sins? You still have a corrupt and a wicked heart as the Bible describes it. My friend, 
Christ came to set the prisoner free. He came to heal the brokenhearted. He came to new hearts. And we would urge you, leave your religion. Leave your trying to do good. Leave that pursuit of looking for a good feeling when you come to church. Cry out to the Lord and ask him to give you a new heart. To wash away all your in his blood. And when he does that, he will put a new song in your mouth. And we will hear you sing with us. We'll be able to sing together as a congregation of righteous to the praise and honour of God alone. It's our God. Our God. Forever. And forever. Let's pray. Oh, our Father, you have treated us so infinitely, miraculously, amazingly. Lord, words can't be found to describe how kind and patient and good you've been to us. All that is ours is equal in Christ. All that yet awaits us. We ask our God that you would fill our minds with these truths which are the reality. Help us, our God, that we may feel them deeply. That we may delight in you. Help us, our God, turn our eyes off ourselves and off one another and onto you. That you may get all the glory. We pray in Jesus' name.